Welcome back to In Plain Sight, using open source data to augment your threat monitoring, sponsored here by Recorded Future on Federal News Network. My guest today is Levi Gundert. He's the Senior Vice President of Global Intelligence at Recorded Future. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. And given the range of sources that Recorded Future adds into its product, and I guess you monitor hundreds of thousands of sources around the world, open source, closed source, manifest web, dark web, an agency wanting to get into this augmentation of its own monitoring using a source like Recorded Future, how do you begin the process of choosing what data you actually need to avoid having this river and overload of, of your people and your systems? Yeah, that's a great question. When, when we onboard our clients, the first thing we do is, is customization and tailoring for the intelligence requirements that the client has. And at its core, Recorded Future is alerting, monitoring, or searching. And the alerting capability is very powerful. And we can automate alerting through an API, which is just a technical way of saying that, you know, we can automate alerting into some sort of system of record uh, that's already being used, or we can alert through email or, or other various types of channels. But those alerts are tailored right, and customized. So we work with the client to, to understand, you know, what sources are important to you, you know, what sort of uh, terms, what sort of events, right, are the, are the, the types of things that you need to be alerted to. And we sort of do that, that charting or that matrix to ensure that there is a high fidelity signal. Yeah, so in a way it forces the agency or the client to really come to terms with precisely what its monitoring is all about. And you don't wanna have a flood of false alerts or alerts that don't lead anywhere just because you can turn them all on and yet you don't wanna miss anything. So it really sounds like a pretty fine grained activity that you need to do to, 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 to lay the groundwork for having a successful program. Absolutely. I think the, the point you just made is so critical is you want to understand what your goals and objectives are up front. You want to understand what you're trying to accomplish. You definitely don't want to go in trying to boil the ocean. If, if you have limited resources, whether it's, you know, manpower, or other types of resources, you're not necessarily looking at, you know, every type of investigation. You probably want to focus on, you know, one or two critical areas that we mentioned before and then really use recorded future uh, to augment, like you were saying, uh, and, and help build that intelligence capability. But yeah, that, that, is, that is such a critical point because it's easy to sort of, it's easy as an, in, an intelligence professional or law enforcement professional, you sort of feel like a kid in a candy store when you first look at recorded future. So it is so important to sort of scope what exactly are, are we looking to, to target here. And a few agencies are skilled at mining the dark web, the web you can't see and can't get to from a standard browser. And so how do you augment that activity? And do people need to understand Tor and the rest of it in, in order to be able to understand what's in the dark web? Because even if you have that browser, then what? You know, where do you go? What do you look at? Yeah, so we have spent a lot of time collecting from, as you said, those types of communities and forums that require different technologies to access uh, and we collect comprehensively against them. So the nice thing is you don't need a Tor browser. We cache all that data in recorded future. So when there's an alert or when you're searching for uh, something and there's a result that you want to dig into, having that data cache in recorded future is, is incredibly valuable. To your point, you don't have to go hop on an undercover computer, spin up the Tor browser and try to get to that same site. So I think, you know, it's really saving analysts and investigators incredible amounts of time. And we've been talking about law enforcement. What about the DOD realm and the cybersecurity realm? Of course, it's universal to every federal agency. What are the trends you're seeing there and what's happening with the data on those fronts? Yeah, just as, just as critical to their mission and mandate, um, obviously, there's multiple multiple components to what they do, and there's obviously a a need for general intelligence on all kinds of situations around the world. Uh, but there's also intelligence required just for the defensive mission of protecting the organization. And we obviously have uh, hundreds of clients in the private sector that use us for that mission as well. Um, and it's certainly impactful. 
I think on both sides, right? Uh, depending on you know exactly what the mission is, but because we're such a, a broad uh, apparatus and capability, there's there's just so many applications. Yeah, and we've been talking about alerting too, but uh, what about the predictive and analytic side of this? Because in many ways, data can point to something that's going to happen before it happens in, in law enforcement and military operations and in cybersecurity. That's gold, right? To know something that's going to happen so you can be ready for when it does happen. Yeah, absolutely. And without getting you know overly complicated and, and technical, you know, we do quite a bit of machine learning inside of the platform uh, and natural language processing where we look at this data uh, and essentially it gets read you know as a human would read it and so the linkages that that get made by a machine um, a lot of those are very predictive in nature especially around some of the technical data so for defenders uh, in the organization you know looking at uh, for instance an IP address uh, sometimes recorded future will be able to provide sort of that forward that forward guidance on you know for example this ip address hasn't been observed uh, doing anything malicious you know now currently presently uh, but there is a sort of predictive indicator that we anticipate this ip address is going to uh, in the future be involved in something malicious and that's sort of the you know part of the power of recorded future it sounds like uh, there's some skill there in ferreting out structured data from unstructured data, because all, many of these sources where people are planning on doing things, communicating what they want to do, that's unstructured. It's natural language, as you say, but embedded in that could be quantities, web addresses, different types of things expressed as numbers that are mixed in. So you almost have a, a like a dual capability of reading what it is that's in the unstructured part, the text part, but also recognizing, wait a minute, that looks like an IP address because IP addresses have a certain format, credit card numbers, social security numbers, and so on. Absolutely. And you you and I talked earlier about open sources and closed sources, but it's, it's important to also include technical sources. A recorded future collects massively on technical sources as well. And that again is sort of the power of the platform is it's not limited to, to one source type. And as you said, obviously there's an enormous amount of unstructured text in the web uh, that needs to be collected and, and analyzed. Uh, but just as important is that structured data, uh, primarily from sort of the you know undercovers of the internet and, and all the various atomic indicators um, that you know comprise the internet and, and what happens on the internet. And so we we collect you know both sides of that equation and you know process it. And as you said, when you look at when you look at this in context, it's sort of determining that, you know, it's a noun, it's a thing. And, and when our system recognizes that, we're, we're able to make linkages to all the other things, right? And we call it an ontology, but it's basically just a system or a structure right? that, that um, sort of underpins the entire platform. So it's, and, it's, it's quite powerful. And what about imagery and video? Does that come into this mix also? So we don't do imagery and video today. Uh, we're looking at you know future future potential to include um, image and video. Right now, you know it's it's primarily based on text, and there's certainly you know some value in in images and videos. But right now, um, we we are you know focused on text because it's um, such such a, a critical capability, and um, you know we'll have to see what the future holds on, sure. on the video. And getting back to the cybersecurity question, when a cybersecurity attack happens, that is a technical source. It sends a piece of code through a network and it lands on a server somewhere and does whatever it's programmed to do. Is Do people find, do you find that there is sometimes text and communication surrounding that piece of technical operation before it happens? Do people discuss, hey, we're going to see if we can get to the State Department or whatever the case might be. I'm trying to get a sense of what it is you monitor for, for cybersecurity or what one should to make sure you're right on top of what could happen. So it's certainly possible, but it's probably less common that actors directly signal, you know, when they're going to attack, what what the, the target or the victim of the attack is and how they're going to do it. I mean, there's certainly plenty of conversations about uh, tooling and tactics in a general sense, but it's it's 
not very common that an actor is going to show their hand uh, before they do it. Um, we do track a lot of active campaigns because we scan the internet the same way that we uh, collect data from the web. So we actually have a lot of proprietary methods and techniques uh, that we deploy to actually detect servers that are staging attacks. Uh, and we're able to also, we have visibility in what we call the gray space, which is that, that space between a victim and an attacker on the internet. And we actually observe a lot of these attacks happening uh, in real time. And we are able to identify both you know, the controller uh, but also the victims. And that's part of our, our technical collection capability. And knowing everything you know about the internet, having been in law enforcement earlier in your career, you know how bad a place the internet is in many ways. Do you still use it just because there's some good on there too? And you feel like, yeah, I can do this. I can buy this stuff online or check out this video. Yeah, I think, there, like you said, um, there's enormous enormous amount of good and, and productivity that's come out of the internet, but there's also a, a lot of dark alleys and, and it's, it's difficult to know, you know, I think if you're not in information security, it's difficult to know how to operate safely on the internet, but you know, there's always some, I think, good rules of the road, you know, being careful what you click on you know, emails that you don't recognize and these sorts of things. Um, I, it, it's tough. I think with disinformation more than anything, you know, we've come to this place where um, social media has become this echo chamber. And oftentimes it's so difficult, you know, to understand, is this actually true? Is this a fact? I think more than anything right now, just looking at sort of threats on, you know, online is disinformation, information operations is uh, such a, a powerful weapon. And, you know, we at Recorded Future, we see, you know, multiple countries engaged in this type of activity, you know, China, Russia, Iran. Uh, but even just, you know, domestic groups internally uh, within the U.S. that, that propagate disinformation, um, it's really hard, I think, for, for people, especially everyone's online more, you know, in the COVID era. And, you know, everyone's trying to figure out, you know, what is true and what is not. And I think it's actually one of the, the biggest challenges that we have with the Internet right now is figuring out, you know, how do I rely on, on the information that I'm, I'm reading? All right. So the old advice, be careful out there, still applies. I want to thank today's guest, Levi Gundert, is the Senior Vice President of Global Intelligence at Recorded Future. I'm Tom Temin. You've been listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Recorded Future.